and that those cards then accumulated and they became um, a wall and it, that wall goes three stories through the museum and it divides um, the public space from the place where the books are stored and where they're um, you have to request so the space or those shelves you don't have access to in the public space are divided by this membrane which carries the hand of all these different readers okay. and then in um, more recently in Seattle the um, there's a, a new library that was built by Rem Cool House it's quite an amazing engineering um, feat, really, the way this building has been built and, and the way the energy works in it. But I had a very small part of it. And down on the ground floor in the area that's um, foreign languages, literacy, English as a second language, where, those collect where that collection is stored, I made a proposal to actually make a floor. And so... Um, the shift from working on the page and working in something that's on your lap and at the proximity of your hand, thinking about that tactile space and just shifting it and bringing it to a building by placing that surface under your feet. And so what I did was uh, work with, actually I worked with a lot of the graduate students here at OSU who were studying in different um, and whose first language uh, we had, let's see, whose first language was not English. And I asked them to um, look at the collection in Seattle and find the companion volumes here. And in 13 different languages, we selected the first line from books in the collection. So in some way, and then, okay, detail. I'm getting ahead of myself. And then what we did is each of those first lines um, in the 13 languages were carved into a wood floor. The wood actually came from Ohio. And um, they're all raised. So rather than being carved in, which is I think how we typically think about something being engraved or marked, these are raised. And so in being raised, they're very much more materially related to an old um, piece of wood type. And, and so following that logic, they're also turned backwards. So they're inverted because if you actually inked this floor and printed it, it would print legible. But to walk on it, it's, it's um, backwards facing. And um, this is how it looked when we first installed it a couple of years ago. There were 25,000 people that showed up in downtown Seattle for the opening of this library. 25,000 people. So it was like this amazing community support that built this building. Um, okay, Jamie, thanks. But what I anticipated and hoped for and what happened over time is that this um, accumulation of all these first lines from the collection actually then also accumulates over it the wear of its users. And so while the um, floor goes underneath the shelves and through this area, the areas that are you can walk on are becoming very heavily marked as if they've been inked and it's been wiped and inked and wiped and inked and wiped. So that just as the selection of these lines in some ways is a document of where the library was at that moment that we made our selection and the shape of that collection, um, over time it reflects um, the history of all of its users. Okay. A lot of people take rubbings. A lot of people are trying, you know, try to read backwards. There were some community groups that were very reticent to let us put their language on the floor. I met with a community of readers that uh, were, whose first language is um, Russian, and they they really did not want me to put it on the floor, and they did not want people walking on their language. And so it was a quite an interesting negotiation with um, different generations of readers and their attitude towards something being on the floor and, and that I, my argument that something being on the floor does not make it dirt. And um, uh, it, was a, it was a kind of more involved social process than I, I think I initially anticipated. Okay, so here it is um, being well-worn, but I think the wood is not wearing. It's just collecting a lot of dirt. There you go. 
And so then that brings me forward to the research that I started doing for this library and thinking about um, the spine of the book tower and the historic reading room, which is so beautifully, beautifully renovated, and the more contemporary reading room that is just above us, as Nancy said, and to think about how do you, how can I bring forward into this that system of access and research of um, coincidence that occurs as you use text in different ways. And I um, became quite intrigued and enamored with a book that I checked out um, from the library, which is a concordance on Darwin's history of the expression of emotions in animals and humans. I think that's right. And this is a page from that book. And uh, so what it does is it takes any text, it takes, it took this text of Darwin's and it orders it alphabetically. And then it gives you the contextual words on either side of that word. So rather than um, arranging the text in its narrative order, it actually rearranges it in its alphabetic one. And that runs through the center of the page like a spine that connects uh, like to unlike um, by an alphabetic logic, and uh, like eating, eating, eats, ebony, etc. And I started thinking about how that's very analogous to what happens when you browse the stacks. And so that's become the structure of what I'm doing for the floor upstairs. And um, I actually have a sample of it. <laughs> So the, the, one of the things that they discovered is how durable and how strong and actually in, um, how well the cork from the historic reading room actually survived, although it was replaced because there was water damage. Um, that old cork floor is um, not only a sustainable material, but really, really durable. And like wood, it actually starts to, it ages really well. It starts to carry the imprint and the history of all of the foots that have walked, the feet that have walked on it. So um, what I did was work um, in conversation with George Acock and the committee to think about how does that cork floor that's in the historic reading room come over and be mirrored but used differently in the contemporary reading room that faces our pack and propose that what we do is um, run a concordance spine of alphabetic words down the center of the room and um, run to the edges of the room the contextual information around that um, word. So then I'm in a huge conundrum. So I have a form, I have a material, I have a system, you know, my system of looking at different texts is through this alphabetic search of the concordance. And at the studio, I'm here with Jamie Boyle. Jamie, hi. <laughs> who we've, uh, we um, and some others um, who aren't here, but we purchased a software program that allowed us a lot of flexibility in the way we could search word documents alphabetically and, and find these kind of surprising um, relationships between things. And for me, what was really interesting as, a, as an artist working with is the way that these searches, it's like the act of reading um, through the concordance pro program in some ways becomes an act of writing or becomes a form of writing. And I think that as an artist I've always been, although we, I spend, like many of you, my, so much of my day writing, I think I'm very nervous about my writing. I think that it's not my first hand. My first hand is more like a sewing hand. And so this way of kind of coming around through the side door to writing is through selecting and finding and juxtaposi juxtaposition has been interesting. Um, and one of the things that we proposed is that there would be a live, a series of live readings on and of the floor once it gets installed. So towards that end, I wanted to um, talk about the conundrum of content and subject, <laughs> which could keep us here for a long time. Um, and um, 
where what what I've now settled on as the material that I'm going to use. I first actually settled on this book, um, A Little History of the World, and I because I started thinking about how many versions there are of the history of the world. And uh, this is actually a book that was written by a famous art historian, E. H. Gombrich, and he wrote a book called The Story of Art. And before he wrote that book, and that book really came about as a consequence of him being commissioned to write a history of the world for kids. And so, okay. And so this is a cover of the book, and then I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but on the right is the beginning of us um, alphabetically sorting this um, text. Okay, make it right. And um, I, you know, I was really drawn to this. I, maybe we should pass the thing out now. Okay. The Not a, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, to take any one, there's this pressure on this project because whatever I choose, whatever text I choose, I remember what how difficult it was when the library was going through the process of selecting each of the floor tiles that you see out in the main floor. And I remember talking to Wes Baumgarten about, oh my gosh, you know, like... <laughs> Like it's going to be there forever. Um, and so I started thinking about how to use this story, which has the perspective and is written in 1935. Uh, it's pretty European in its perspective. And it's really written f um, without the language is like and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened and it's sort of an accounting that accumulates and um, I actually read it to my son who's now 14 and we took utter delight in reading this book out loud so I returned to it for this project it was also recently republished um, and then the next text um, I started thinking about how what we do when we read is we weave everything we've ever read together with the thing we're reading at that moment. And so how does this metaphor of weaving, of, of something actually um, literally become, how does text become a textile? And so I wanted to find another history of the world or an origin story. And um, I was attracted to one that was really very much about how the world is, a, is the story of the world is woven. And um, I adapted a story that's from the White, White River Sioux. It's called The End of the World. And Jamie's actually passing out some versions of this. Um, and I, I think I'll just read this one out loud just so you can hear it because it becomes, these words actually become the spine text for the floor that we're doing upstairs. Um, somewhere in a place where the land and the mountains meet, there is a deep and hidden cave. People have searched for a long, long time, but no one has ever discovered its location. In the cave lives an old woman dressed in animal skin whose face is dry and worn. For a thousand years or more, she has been sitting the way our ancestors did, making a piece of cloth out of dyed porcupine quills for a buffalo robe. Resting beside her, watching, is a black dog. His eyes never wander from the old woman. He is her only companion. A few steps from where she sits burns a fire that began before memories were recorded. Over the fire hangs a pot the kind made with clay from the earth and used before the white man arrived with iron vessels. In it, the boiling food is good and sweet and red. This meal has been cooking steadily for as long as the fire has burned.